Uh, welcome. We are in sophomore English. We are on page 463 of our hymnal, and we are now working A with the writing assessment of packet 10 uh, on 463, and then we'll spend the rest of our hour maybe exegeting some of the, uh, some of the texts, that kind of thing. Uh, let's begin, first of all, by identifying the topic itself. Um, we're asked, notice, although living more than uh, 2,000 years apart, I'm sorry, more than 1,000 years apart, uh, the Lam text, the Tufu uh, text, experience this word displacement. You might want to jot that word down already from their homelands. Uh, diaspora is often the term that's used. I think we did that text right in here, diaspora. This notion of being dispersed, being uh, exiled, being forced to depart. You'll notice that there's a number of the texts we've already worked with at 3A that kind of play that same game. I used to live here and now I don't live here anymore, that kind of thing. Right? Sometimes that's by choice, most of the time obviously not. In their works, both writers attempt to give readers an impression of their lives as political exiles. In a four or five paragraph, obviously for us five, uh, essay, uh, compare and contrast how the two authors explore this theme, what the, what the, the political exile, right, and the, and the, the diaspora, right? Um, do the selections offer a similar message about refugee life? What's a refugee? Like you got it. Someone who is required to live outside of his or her native country, not, not by choice, usually by requirement of some kind, right? Um, in what ways do the messages differ? Cite evidence, of course, we use the term validation to support your response. Okay, let's point out right away that they, they're going to give you at step two here on this page an outline. So the assumption is that if you bullet pointed 463 at all, you probably at, at step two there, you've already got some kind of an outline for yourself. The more important thing about outlining this is the specific quotes that you're going to use from the two texts to validate, that is to say internal validation. Um, let's just talk about it real quickly. Uh, for you, what are the similarities? Throw out some real quickly, and then what are some of the differences? So go ahead on the paper in front of you, if, you, if you're working with uh, you know, annotations or whatever, because you've already written this paper, you're working off of stuff you've already written. If you haven't yet written the paper, then we're assuming, obviously, that you've read the text. What are some similarities in regards to what they speak about? Refugees and exile. Say it out loud. Yeah, warfare, conflict of some violent kind is usually going to be the essence of why the displacement occurred in the first place. So what? Keep going. What's the point of that? They're both negatively affected. Yeah, there's going to be all kinds of levels of psychic scarring that will happen. A lot of times children themselves maybe don't have much uh, in terms of actual concern. It's their parents who then have to raise these children in a really stressful environment. That affects the upbringing of the child in any number of ways, right? So, for example, what, you know, later the child often will go, whoa, I see now why my mother, for example, was, you know, kind of had the struggles that she had, etc. What are some other similarities? Both authors were exiled with their families. Family exiles, so they were there not alone but with others. Sometimes we would argue that's easier. Sometimes we would argue that's more difficult. Why would it be possibly more difficult? More people here, family members get hurt. Yes, right. I mean, if you're there by yourself, maybe you can at least say, well, at least my family is safe back somewhere else or whatever. Now, no, and then I get to watch the painful experience, right, of displacement. Another similarity? Any others? There he is, good, yeah. This is the, both these texts are what we are, I'm gonna use an academic term, propedeutic, over relating to didactic, over relating to instructional. In other words, both of these texts have as their primary focus, let me tell you something that you might need to know. Who's the intended audience then? Other, um, yeah. Other potential refugees, namely who? Like kids? Yeah, good, yeah, really, it's, it's more like talking to younger people, isn't it, about, listen, this is kind of the experience of what it means. What other audience? Because most of us who have read this haven't ever been political exiles. What's the advantage of us reading a text like this? You can relate it to others. In what ways is this an eye-opener for students who have grown up in Warland? To see how, what they want. Right, right. We find ourselves kind of looking at this going, no way. Obviously, this is, it's so strange to imagine that some kids actually live with 
this. Wait a minute, a long time ago or right now? Well, yeah, right, right. Where on the planet, jot down on your paper, where on the planet are you familiar at all where kids are not concerned about their forensics tournaments, their flag stuff, their swimming, their, their golfing, their basketball. That's not on their radar because they live in absolute hell right now. Their, their goal is to just be alive here in the next day. Where in the world on the planet are those kinds of experiences happening right now? Are you at all familiar? There, clearly a whole lot of the Middle Eastern places, right? Lots and lots of countries in, in, in Africa. Yeah. This is a serious problem, right? Mm -hmm. Where young people um, are having all kinds of challenges. Of course, are you familiar with the young girl who was uh, shot yeah. in the head because she wanted to be educated? Whoa, well, I don't understand it. Like, what's up with that? Why would, why would she not allow to be educated? Well, she's a woman. Yeah. She's female in a class, in an honors class of all females. <laughs> Woo, right? This is, uh, but I think at times we can kind of take for granted the privilege that is our education. Reading a text like this obviously can help us. Let's go to the other side of the line. Let's talk about differences between the two texts. What do you see as being primary differences maybe between these two texts? Any Miss Costales you want to point out? I Any? thought that the letter uh, talked more about defending just your yourself and your family, mm. uh, whereas the other text kind of seemed as though it was talking about grouping together. Interesting. So one is more of a perspective that's familial as opposed to maybe more, we would say, broader social. Excellent. That's a great observation. Anybody else? Do you find the wording, the tone at all different in the two? The one was more about having hope and the other one was pretty bleak. Good, yes. You're going to see maybe we might draw the distinction between optimism versus pessimism. Clearly in really extreme challenging situations, what do you think is the natural response? Optimism or pessimism? It is, isn't it? Right? I mean, you go from having this great life, or at least some life, to having to survive. And in that process, it's kind of natural that you might not be able to see much good only maybe really terrible stuff, right, we might say. All right, so you got a sense of what you're working with then? Let's now go backwards, and I want to, uh, I want to begin now by picking up some texts that, unfortunately, because of our scheduling and my absence that we weren't able to mess with, I want to go to a couple of poems real quickly. We'll start on 444 with the uh, Stephen Crane text, Do Not Weep, Maiden, For War Is Kind. Much could be said, of course, as well of the image on 445. Uh, we'll maybe ask about what you see happening there. I want to begin in your notes here uh, by asking you to consider the notion of what we will call verbal irony, okay? Um, irony, say one thing means something else, right? Stephen Crane's poem here is a classic example of that. By the way, if you don't have your annotations in front of you, it ain't no big thing. Let's just work with the text itself. Do not weep, maiden, for war is kind. Are you ready? Let's look at it together, shall we? Do not weep, maiden, for war is kind, because your lover threw wild hands toward the sky and the affrighted steed ran on alone. Do not weep, war is kind. Horse, booming drums of the regiment, little souls who thirst for fight. These men were born to drill and die. The unexplained glory flies above them. Great is the battle god, great, and his kingdom, a field where a thousand corpses lie. Do not weep, babe, for war is kind, because your father tumbled in the yellow trenches, raged at his breast, gulped and died. Do not weep, war is kind. Swift blazing flag of the regiment, eagle with crest of red and gold, these men were born to drill and die. Point for them the virtue of slaughter. Make plain to them the excellence of killing in a field where a thousand corpses lie. Mother, whose heart hung humble as a button on the bright splendid shroud of your son, do not weep. War is kind. I want to begin actually now working at level 2B, and I want to point out the form that we will call poetic form. Do you see anything significant about the form of this poem? Repetition. There is some repetition, no doubt. 
I'm speaking now, though, about the form as it lays on the page. What do you make of the fact that this is a poem of how many stanzas? And notice that alternating stanzas are indented. Does anyone want to already make an observation about what's going on there? What do you think Crane's doing there? As a poet, what do you think he's doing? The two sets of lines that are indented. Do you see any similarities? It's kind of like a chorus in a song. It is. Let's point it out. This is almost like a chorus in a song. Outstanding job, Winters. You're right. It plays the role of kind of like a chorus, doesn't it? That is to say this poem itself has a <laughs> melodic kind of lilt to it. Almost like a song of sorts, right? Almost, we might say, like a ditty. Like, la-ti-da. War, it's no big deal. It's kind of like... Right? Are you at all, 3, 3A observation, are you at all familiar with a song you listen to on your iPod that has a kind of a tune that's really lighthearted and upbeat, but the words of the song are really, really dark? And they're kind of like, you know, um, they're, they're, it, it's, it's, if you just heard the song at first, you'd be like, oh, that's a like happy song. But then when you hear the words to the song, you're like, Oh, no, that's not a happy song. That is a nasty song. That's a game Stephen Crane is playing here. Let's jump real quickly now to a bit of biography. Crane is known for one of the classic American novellas. We don't call it a novel because it's not long enough. We don't call it a short story because it's too long. And so we split the difference and we call it a novella. Jot down, what is the classic title? of this classic text written by Stephen Crane. Does anyone know? Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with war. The Red Badge of Courage. You're right. Mm -hmm. Now put a note to yourself. Red Badge of Courage is a classic novel. We will look at it as juniors. You'll be reading it next summer as you get ready for your junior experience. This is a really important novel where we learn about the American Civil War. Crane actually writing the novel after the American Civil War, he never witnessed any of the fighting that happened in the Civil War. He talked to veterans of that war, and you'll have some kind of reflection that's similar here. The father falling down into the trench, holding his chest as he gulps blood and dies. These are similar kinds of types of uh, pictures we get in Red Badge of Courage. A, a, no, a novella about a young boy who grew up reading the Iliad and wanted to be a fighter. Yay, fighters! Yay, heroes! It would be not unlike young boys today watching or playing violent video games. And they're so excited to join the military so they can go into the conquest and shoot down zombies or whatever. <laughs> the only problem for this young man is that, like most young men in battle... He ends up having nothing to do. They sit around and do nothing for long, protracted periods of time. They keep hoping for a battle that one never comes. They talk about how heroic they will be when the battle finally comes. Battle finally comes, bullets whizzing all around him. He turns around and runs away in horror. He's seeing men around him getting shot, and he's like, Whoa, 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 I'm not supposed to be, I'm supposed to be home on the farm turns around and runs. Low-lying branch, because there's so much smoke, whacks him right across the head, completely knocks him out. When he comes to, he has this terrible headache, blood all over his face, the battle's ended. He goes wandering around trying to find his way, ultimately does back to his camp. When he walks in, they're like, dude, you got wounded. You got shot in the head and you survived. Yes, I did. Oh, you're like a hero. They treat him like a hero. For a while, he likes it. It's like, yes, I am. But over time, it feeds on his psyche. He's like, dude, I was like running away. I'm a total coward. And these guys all think I'm like a total hero. And he can't live with himself. He tries to kind of maybe leave, ultimately ends up back, ultimately ends up in the fight, and ultimately gains his red badge of courage. You can kind of see where this goes. Let's talk about the verbal irony of a text like this. Uh, by the way, I think Winters and Ermintrot, you guys are supposed yes. to go do your thing. Wait, let's, take a, 
I'm sorry, two is what I think he said. At three was when he needed. Let's talk real quickly about this. Uh, some of the irony. What is the what is the central irony of this text? The kind of yeah, the notion that oh no no it's great when all that slaughter takes place it's great. What's going on in the chorus? Do you think that's important? Um, what is being shown? The actual Versus. Uh, talking to the. Like the people who had to deal with them leaving. Good. And you've got to also notice in the first chorus, or first indention as, as we were looking at it, notice you've got the drums, you've got all the sounds. Uh, make a note of all the different sensual references, the things you can hear, you can see, you can touch, smell, etc. Great is the battle god, great and his kingdom, a field where a thousand corpses lies. Of course, the line that's recapitulated, repeated, right? Notice in the second choral uh, indention, these men were born to drill and die. Another recapitulation. What do you make of that line? These men were born to drill and die. What does drill mean here? Like, do you like... Yes, the exercising, the marching to get ready, right? You, you, you try and be really disciplined in the build-up to the battle, so that way when the battle comes, everyone doesn't turn around and run away in fright. They kind of like feel like this is okay. What is the ironic suggestion, though, about these young men who were born to die? That they were just farm boys. Yes, it wasn't like they were born with, yay, I get to go be a soldier. It's almost like... This is the inevitable fate. Mm -hmm. Happy or sad poem? Sad. sad. It's it's really kind of sad. Humble. In what way humble? Uh, it's not necessarily dwelling. See, the other text right after this one is dwelling on the depression of it. Well, this is saying it is necessary. It is. Yeah. What's mm -hmm. ironic about that? Given especially the picture on 445. Do you think this poem will give this woman any comfort if it's no. her son or her husband who was... No. 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 See, that's the point, right? This poem's not going to provide us with much comfort. It's more like a statement of... This is unnecessary. Almost like, yeah, sucks to be you. Huh. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, the uselessness of all of these. Notice how many corpses? A thousand. A thousand, which is, of course, in Crane's day going to reference an unheard of number of people dying in a battle, right? I mean, we're familiar, of course, with, we were talking about the dropping of the atomic weapon at Hiroshima and the number of people who could die in an instant, right? Let's take a look at Sonnet Ballad. And uh, there's several things I want to point out about this poem right away. Uh-oh, how many lines? What is it Gwendolyn Brooks has given to us here? How many lines? 14. There are 14 lines. What's significant about that for 2B? What's in the title? What's the title? What is a sonnet? Do we know this yet? It's like a one little part of part of the sonnet. All right, let's define it real quickly. A sonnet is a poem of a specific number of lines. Gee, I wonder how many. 14. Right, very good. A sonnet is also a poem that will not only have 14 lines, but will have a certain identifiable rhyme scheme. That is to say, certain words at the end will rhyme with other words at the end. Sometimes this rhyme scheme can be very, very prescribed. When we study Shakespeare's sonnets, we will see that. Other times the games can get played. Gwendolyn Brooks here is going to play a game with her sonnet ballad. What is a ballad? Like, kind of like a it is a song, right. It's like a song. So we're going to put the two of those together. Let's take a look at this poem for a moment. Oh, mother, mother, where is happiness? They took my lover's tallness off to war, left me lamenting. Now I cannot guess what I can use an empty heart cup for. He won't be coming back here anymore. Someday the war will end, but oh, I knew when he went walking grandly out that door that my sweet love would have to be untrue, would have to be untrue, would have to court coquettish death, whose impudent and strange possessive arms and beauty of a sort can make a hard man hesitate and change. And he will be the one to stammer, yes. Oh, mother, mother, where is happiness? Now, I'd like to point out right away, this is an extreme, extremely complicated poem. 
It's a brilliantly constructed offering, but it's not one that we can usually teach to seventh graders. They have a hard time getting it, if you will. But by the time we're sophomores, we can begin to kind of appreciate the game, and I underline that word or put quotation marks around it, the game that Gwendolyn Brooks is playing here. Notice the speaker of the poem. Who is speaking in this poem? The Young or old? Young. 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 Speaking to who? Her mother. Her mom. Notice the series of questions that she asks at the beginning of the poem. Her first one is, where is happiness? Which tells us right away, what about her? She's upset. She is extremely upset, right? She's extremely upset. The second line will begin to tell us why she's so unhappy. Notice they. It is a vague antecedent. They who, the right, you see, took my lover's tallness off to war. Notice, Miss Hodges, it's not they took my lover off to war. They took his tallness off to war. Which right away makes the reader go, what, what do you mean? They're, how can you take someone's tallness off to war? And immediately we recognize Gwendolyn Brooks is playing games with language here. Heart Cup will be another example of this, where she's going to use language in a kind of slanted way. Do you have any sense of what this tallness thing is about? Like he was all confident. In yes, that's right. He's confident. In fact, he's what? He was. Uh, did he? Did was he? Was he like really scared to go? No. no. This is a guy who's ready to go, looking all spiffy. She'll say later in his uniform, all dressed up, looking fine. Right? She says he's going. He, they took him off to work. Keep looking. Uh, left me lamenting. Uh oh. What does the word lament mean? Like, to lament means what? It's a good SAT word like for three? us. There is a book in the Judeo-Christian Bible called the Book of Lamentations. A lament is a sad song. In other words, they took my lover off to war, leaving me sad, right? Now, I cannot guess what I can use an empty heart cup for. Uh-oh, what's wrong? What does she say? I'm never going to what? I'm never going to be happy or love again. The opening question, where is happiness, right? We'll keep going now. Someday the war will end, which tells us that while this poet speaker is speaking, the war is still ongoing, right? It's like it hasn't been ended yet. Will end, but oh, I knew when he went walking, look at the adverb, grandly out that door, that my sweet love would have to be untrue. Now, what does the word untrue mean? Yeah, cheat. Cheat on me. He looked so fine in the beautiful uniform. I knew he was going to mess around on me. What's the irony? She says, he messed around on me. So. Messed around on me with who? Death. With death. And then all of a sudden, it's like a reader, a sophisticated reader of this poem goes, Oh, whoa, 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 Gwendolyn Brooks is playing a really interesting game. She says, my lover went off and messed around with another, and I'm sad about that. I guess I should have known, though. He looked so fine in his uniform. It was only a matter of time before he would mess around with somebody else. Of course, the somebody else isn't another woman, right? It is, of course, the death that was waiting him. Look at how Brooks finishes, right? When he went walking grandly out that door that my sweet love would have to be untrue, would have to be untrue to make it a ballad. You almost had this repetition of the line. Would have to court coquettish death. Coquette, a coquette is, a, is a what? Does anyone know that word? If you are a coquette, you are a flirt. Okay, in other words, I knew it. I knew that he would go off in his fine uniform and he'd mess around with some cute flirt who would be flirting with him and would take him away from me, notice though it's death here, whose impudent and strange possessive arms and beauty, parenthetic, of a sort, in parenthetic, death has this strange personification in this poem of being a gorgeous woman, a Victoria's Secret model. I knew it. I knew he would go off to war looking so fine and he would find the most beautiful woman, coquettish, flirtish, death. In other words, what's it tell us about his attitude about leaving? He wasn't. He was like, yeah, 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 I'm going to go do this thing and prove my manhood. I'll be back. And she says, ah, he went and found another lover, a lover who's a flirt, a total flirt, who wrapped arms around him 
and beauty notice of a sort can make a hard man hesitate and change. Even a hard man will look at this beautiful, gorgeous death and say, keep going, and he will be the one to stammer, yes. In other words, at the final moment, maybe he didn't want to make the charge that would, for example, lead to his death. And yet, he's a guy, so he's like, okay, okay, I'm supposed to do this. I guess I'll, wham, now he's gone. The final line again will recapitulate the beginning line, right? Where is happiness? A lamentation of a sort, right? A sadness. What's the tone of a poem like this? Do you make it out? What's the tone of this kind of poem? Is she angry? Is she sad? Bitter. Let's write that one down. That's a good one. Bitter is a good adjective for this one, isn't it? It's like, oh, I knew it. I knew when he left looking so fine, he was going to go mess around on me. And that's exactly what he did. In what ways is this speaker made more lonely by referencing her mother? What's the mother got to do with it? Maybe nothing that she has. That's all that's left for her. Before she had her guy, now she's got as her mom. She will lament with her mom. I don't, I don't know what to do. But notice the poem doesn't say I don't know what to do. The poem says what? Where is happiness at? This is an interesting and poetic way we might say for her to phrase the observation. I will never again what? Maybe. Love? What, would you, what else would you say? Be happy. What if both of these poems now are 3A observation? What if both of these poems seem to say about the collateral damage of war? Who do you think is more difficult for in war? The people who are fighting in the war or the people who get stuck back home? The guys fighting in the war have bullets being shot at them. Every day they get up, they, they go, maybe today's the day I get to die. But like his families, they could get up every morning and be like, whoa, what if he's not alive? You know? Yes. He's still alive. The ones left behind are the ones that know so little, right? They have no control of any kind, and they're the ones who get to live after the passing. Here in this poem's case, it's not a pretty picture at all, huh? Think it's harder on the daughter or on the mother in this poem? Well, I think that it might be harder on the mother. Why would you argue that? Of course, this is difficult before we've been mothers, right? Well, to know. Like, I mean, obviously, if it's your daughter's boyfriend or whatever, you're going to know him, so you're going to be sad about that. But then you also have to watch her. Yeah, go so through sad. the process of losing so the you, one like, she loves. Go through both stages of it, because you're sad, but you're also even more sad for her because you have to watch it. Very important observation. She's got two moms have two levels of anxiety or pain that moms get to experience. The first is to watch, of course, the passing of her. By the way, notice she calls him her lover, but that doesn't preclude the possibility of her being, of him being her. Like brother. Her bro you bet. Could be, right. That's right. Could be, could be also her husband, right? Could be her husband as opposed to just her lover, right? And so the mom gets to deal with that, but then the mom also gets to deal with the fact that the daughter is asking a really disturbing question. Where is happiness? Which seems to suggest, She's like lost her wisdom. I'm never gonna, yeah, I'm never gonna really be happy again. I have no hope. That would be really hard on a mom as well, wouldn't it, right? Let's talk about E.M. Forrester's uh, essay, Tolerance, for just a few seconds. This is a really, really radical essay. And it was for the time it was published. E.M. Forrester, I'll start again with biography, is one of our most important 20th century authors. He wrote some of our most important novels. Passage to India, made into a film that I highly recommend because it won the Academy Award several years ago. If you haven't, heard, if you haven't ever 
heard of this film, check it out on Netflix for sure and watch it. You'll love it. it it's a great film. Um, Howard's End, another film of a novel that became very important. Where Angels Fear to, Dread, to Tread, another really important novel that was made into film. Many of E.M. Forrester's uh, are made into film. But maybe the most famous, even believe it or not, even more famous than uh, Passage to India, is the novel Room with a View. So jot that one down as well. Miss Irving. like one more? I'm sorry? If you'd like one Ms. more. Ms. Gustalis, I'll let you uh, depart and go do one more if you'd like. To Mr. Tonkovich's room? Yes. Okay. Um, room with a View. I highly recommend that you write that one down. Another no And all of these are novels that I highly recommend that you read. Your textbook, however, doesn't give us an example of Forrester's, pro um, uh, non or Forrester's fiction, but rather an example of his nonfiction. Now, if I were to ask you in the form of a question, Ms. Kennedy, this essay posits two observations that are of greatest import. What would those two observations be? You, you can take a stab at seeing how close you are to the question's answer that Mr. McGee is looking for. Um. The essay divides rather neatly into two parts. One, by the way, he's writing after what conflict? Do we know? What conflict has just happened that requires the writing of this essay. You got it, the Second World War, where tremendous devastation, horrific death, eight million Jews alone died in the Holocaust. Right? Forrester will say, bad deal. Question, how do you fix it? How do you rebuild a world that has been totally destroyed with war, with genocide, with death, with Holocaust? It's then that he posits the second interesting observation. He says, most people would argue that what's needed is love. love. You, gotta, you gotta have love to fix it. Which, of course, is an important idea if you're speaking theologically, right? Love. If you know the song of the Beatles that will be written a little few years after this is, of course, that sentiment, all you need is love. But Forrester will make an interesting argument. He says, way wrong answer. Love is not only a bad idea, it can't work. Whoa. Immediately calling into question a fundamental principle of most theological systems, whether it be Christian, Jewish, or Islamic, the idea that foundationally one needs to love others. He says it's not love at all. What does he call it? Tolerance. There it is in the title. What is tolerance as Forrester defines it? Just what is it? Accepting that there's Accepting difference. that others are the way they are. You don't have to love it. You, you don't have, have to, to like them. them. You have to put up with them. Let's say it now in Worland High School language. It's not that there isn't drama, drama, drama because we know it exists. It's not that you don't have an opinion. You have an opinion. You just don't have to say it. What an interesting idea. This is the way to resolve conflict, Forrester says. This, by the way, is why this essay becomes so popular. He says it this way. If you want to resolve conflict at Worland High School, it's not that you don't have opinions about people. It's that you don't Speak them out loud. Question, why is that so hard? Teenagers are very opinionated, though. Teenagers are opinionated? Everyone. Well, when you're speaking in a high school. You're saying school. teachers are not opinionated. I thought you meant just like high school drama type. Yeah, but say. don't teachers participate in drama, <laughs> drama, drama, drama too? Before we end our yeah. Day. Just beat him right yeah. Up. Thanks, guys. We'll uh, do some more work tomorrow. Get a paper written. I'm gonna be